Um, so today we're, re we're really happy to have uh, Jared Duver Lickman from uh, the University of Oxford speaking on twin primes and a modified linear sieve. Great. Um, I'm very glad to be here. And I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me to, the opportunity to speak today and for all of you to come along. So today I'm going to be speaking about uh, twin primes and a modification of the linear sieve. So as an outline, we will be discussing twin primes, specifically the twin prime conjecture, the Hardy-Littlewood asymptotic, and give a highlight of a new upper bound for the counter twin primes up to x. Then we will dive into sieve methods, uh, first giving some general motivation for the area, because for those maybe seeing some of these ideas for the first time, there can be uh, a handful of notation and it can appear uh, somewhat technical. So whenever possible, we'll try to minimize this technicality and try just to give uh, the basic feeling of the area. And we'll, we'll do the minimum in order to motivate and build up to the classical linear sieve bound. Once done with that, we'll describe uh, equidistribution results for primes in arithmetic progressions, specifically uh, progressions to large moduli. And uh, with these two components of sieve methods and equidistribution, we'll be able to describe the main result of this talk, which is a new upper bound for a modified linear sieve. So up to this point, uh, the talk will be motivating the main result. Uh, and in the remainder, uh, in the remaining time, we'll give a sketch of the proof ideas that go into this result, which will uh, give us a, an under, a, a better look at what the sieve weights look like under the hood or as I've been uh, recently informed, under the bonnet in the UK slang. So specifically, we'll be defining uh, sieve weights themselves, uh, describing some of their factorization properties, and give uh, a connection between the weights and the equidistribution of primes in arithmetic progressions. And for those who are interested uh, to, look, uh, to learn more details, uh, this talk will be good preparation for reading uh, the full paper, which is available on the archive. So the twin prime conjecture is one of the great open problems in mathematics. And it asserts that there are infinitely many pairs of prime numbers of the form p and p plus two. So in other words, if we denote by pi two of x as the counting function uh, of primes up to x, such that p plus two is also prime, then the conjecture asserts that this function diverges as x goes to infinity. Unfortunately, we don't really have any uh, non-trivial lower bounds for this counting function pi two. Uh, however, upper bounds for pi two have been studied uh, throughout the 20th century, starting in the 20th century, first by Brun, Selberg and others. Uh, and this led really, and, and this problem for studying upper bounds has led uh, to the development of sieve theory in its modern form. Uh, in particular for pi two, uh, Hardy and Littlewood uh, made a precise conjecture in 1923 for the asymptotic behavior of pi two as a constant times x over log x squared. And this constant is approximately 1.32. Um, and it's specifically given uh, as an explicit product uh, over primes, uh, odd primes in the form below. And this constant S2, which is approximately 0.66, uh, is sometimes referred to as a singular series. Uh, other times it's called a twin prime constant or even uh, the Hardy-Littlewood constant. So uh, later in this talk, when we uh, come to sieves, uh, we'll get a feeling for how such a product S2 would arise, at least from a heuristic perspective. 
Uh, and of course, uh, throughout the talk, uh, if there are questions, uh, uh, just please don't hesitate. So now if we define the Hardy-Littlewood asymptotic to be capital pi, that is pi of x to be two times our constant S2 times x over log x squared, then the main bound I'd like to present is that as x tends to infinity, the count of twin primes, little pi two, is asymptotically less than or equal to uh, a constant uh, a little less than 3.3 .3 times capital pi of x. So this problem has been studied uh, over several decades. And uh, in the course of this talk, I'd like to try to motivate some of the ideas uh, as they've developed uh, over the work of many authors uh, building up a, a repository of knowledge. Um, and in particular, in this plot below, uh, we can see uh, the previous uh, bound that was known from 2004 due to Wu uh, of, a con uh, of a factor times the Hardy-Littlewood asymptotic a little less than 3.3. And also of particular relevance uh, to us in this talk is the work of Bombieri, Friedlander, and Ivanitz uh, in 1986, uh, which resulted in the bound of uh, 3.5 times the Hardy-Littlewood asymptotic. So the main idea, uh, the main uh, area I'd like to talk about uh, today is to do with sieve methods. Um, and the basic setup is that we have a finite set A of positive integers and a parameter Z uh, a real parameter z that's at least one, that's greater than one. And uh, sieve methods offer a broad framework for us to estimate the count, which we call s of a comma z, which denotes the number of integers in a, all of whose prime factors exceed z. And uh, just from a rough standpoint, uh, if it, a is sufficiently equidistributed in arithmetic progressions, then one might expect that uh, this count, s of a comma z, uh, approximately behaves like the size of a divided by log z, uh, at least with some constant, uh, c. Uh, and the constant uh, should be thought of as encoding some local information about uh, a modulo primes. And by a being equidistributed, this should uh, more precisely mean uh, a little bit more precisely, that the set of multiples a sub d, so if we take an integer d, uh, we define the set a sub d to be uh, the numbers in a, uh, which are multiples of d. And a being equidistributed uh, should mean to us that the, the set of multiples a sub d is roughly of the expected density. And for example, in the case where uh, a is an interval, uh, we'd expect uh, roughly one over d uh, proportion of integers in a to fall in a sub d. So uh, we have uh, our sibs, uh, sieve methods uh, set up where we have a finite set a, a parameter z, and we have our set of multiples a sub d and the count we're interested in s of a comma z. So to be a little bit more precise, uh, suppose that the density of a sub d is approximated by a multiplicative function g, which goes from the natural numbers uh, into the interval of 0 to 1. Uh, and by, uh, density, by approximating the density, I just mean that the size of a sub d, the size of the set of multiples, is approximately the size of a times this multiplicative function uh, at d. So under this assumption uh, of a function g, one should expect uh, roughly uh, as a heuristic that the, this count s of a comma z is approximately uh, the size of a times uh, a corresponding product over primes up to z of one minus g of p. And uh, if we assume, uh, for example, that g of p uh, asymptotically behaves like one over p, by Merton's product theorem, this will uh, tell us that this prime product uh, is roughly a constant divided by log z. And this recovers what we had uh, 
kind of and, and this gives us an, uh, a heuristic expectation for what we should get for S of A comma Z. Uh, in particular, uh, for our purposes, we're interested in applying sieves uh, to studying twin primes. Uh, and sieves are relevant here because uh, if we choose our set A to be the set of uh, numbers of the form P plus two, uh, where P is a prime up to X, and we choose a parameter Z uh, less than the square root of X, uh, then by definition of S of A comma Z, all twin primes in the interval between Z and X will be counted. And so in particular, uh, if we trivially just bound the all integers up to Z by O of Z, uh, then we have uh, an in a simple inequality uh, that S of A comma Z is bigger than uh, greater or equal to uh, the count of twin primes pi two plus uh, a, neg a, a relatively small factor O of Z. And moreover, this count uh, is an equality when Z is equal to root X up to a factor O of log Z. And in particular, for this choice of set A of uh, primes shifted by two, uh, the density uh, function is given by one over phi where phi is Euler's phi function. And this is just because the prime number theorem for arithmetic progressions tells us that, um, well, the, the set of multiples a sub d is now counting the number of primes up to x, which are congruent to minus two mod d. And by the prime number theorem, this will be approximately uh, all of the primes up to x divided by phi of d, at least for odd numbers d. Okay, so now we can uh, describe uh, the particular sieve we're interested in. So there are many sieves uh, one can study, uh, notably uh, Brun sieve or Selberg sieve or the large sieve. There, there are many sieves in, in that, that one can think about, but for our particular uh, interest today, we're gonna be uh, describing the linear sieve. Uh, and in this case, uh, we have a density function as before, uh, which is multiplicative. Uh, so it approximates the size of the set of multiples a sub d. And we're also imposing a linear condition that on primes, g of p is asymptotically one over p. And this, is, this, condi this linear condition is uh, where the name the linear sieve uh, is coming from. And uh, throughout the talk, I'll be making kind of impre some imprecise statements, but uh, this uh, doesn't even, so th this linear condition can sometimes even be relaxed to not just uh, require uh, G of P being close to one over P, but maybe in some average sense. Um, so, so there is some flexibility here that I'm suppressing for simplicity. So in this setup, uh, if we let our uh, parameter Z to be written in the form uh, D to the one over S, um, and we'll, uh, we'll describe here, uh, in a bit, what this level D is, um, the linear sieve, so, so now we, we'll, we, we've introduced uh, uh, a number S, uh, the linear sieve of level D uh, will, will give us a bound on the count S of A comma Z, uh, roughly of the expected form. Uh, so we have the size of A, uh, our familiar product over primes up to Z, but we also have uh, a, a factor, capital F of S, as a function of, of s, which is log d over log z. Uh, in particular, uh, if the parameter s is less than three, uh, this factor is described explicitly by the formula two times e to the gamma over s. Uh, and here, gamma is the euler mascheroni constant. Also, uh, if s tends to infinity, uh, it turns out that this, this factor capital F of s tends to one. And and in this case, if you substitute in one, we recover uh, the expected bound that we've seen before. So this factor f of s, which arises from the linear sieve bound, uh, the upper bound for the linear sieve, uh, it is defined, so it's a function uh, defined via uh, a system of delay differential equations uh, along with a companion function, little f, 
uh, which also gives uh, an analogous lower bound uh, for the linear sieve, uh, though we won't be uh, focusing too much on lower bounds at the moment. So on the left, uh, we have a plot of these functions, big F and little f, uh, in orange and blue, respectively. And we can see uh, that uh, as uh, S grows, both of these functions uh, tend to one rather rapidly. And they're always uh, bounded above and below by one, respectively. And so in this uh, delay differential equation, we have initial conditions for big F up to for S up to three and little f just to be zero up to two. And to propagate out these initial conditions, we have this, we have this linked uh, delay differential system. So for example, so this is a compact form to write these functions in. So for example, if we wanted to extend out the definition of little f, uh, we could into, uh, all we have to do is integrate big F uh, on the previous uh, strip. Um, and for example, this, this tells us that little f is equal to two times e to the gamma over s times log of s minus one. And this is when s is between two and four. Uh, and similarly, if you now integrate out uh, little f, you can recover big F on the, uh, the next uh, strip uh, for s between uh, three and five, given in this integral. OK, so we have this uh, delay differential uh, equation. Uh, it turns out that uh, these functions, uh, so they might appear quite arbitrary on, on first sight, it turns out these functions are quite natural um, and they can be described uh, for those who uh, have heard of them uh, in terms of the book, uh, the book stab function uh, and the Dickman function, which are intimately connected with describing the distribution of integers that have uh, only small prime factors or only large prime factors. Um, and moreover, uh, we, it turns out that when studying the linear, when studying sieve uh, problems, it turns out the, uh, linear sieve bounds are optimal in the sense that with using these functions, big F and little f, uh, the linear sieve bounds are sharply attained for particular choices of sets A. Uh, specifically, uh, if you choose A to be the set of numbers uh, up to X that have an odd number of prime factors, uh, including multiplicity, uh, then you can recover uh, the sharp upper bound and similarly, if you take the even number of prime factors, you can get an optimal lower bound. And this was uh, shown, found by, th this example was found by I Ivanitz and Selberg. Uh, moreover, uh, if we even if we restrict our attention to the class of sets uh, A that are of the form of an interval, say between Y and X, uh, any improvements we would get on the linear sieve functions uh, over big F and little f would lead to progress on Ziegel zeros. Uh, and this is a result due to Granville. Um, and so from this example, or this, uh, the, the example of intervals should uh, really suggest to us that is uh, even in restricted settings, uh, it is a difficult task to try to improve the linear sieve bounds. Um, and doing so would have very strong implications for uh, the distribution of uh, zeros of the zeta function and consequently um, uh, for prime numbers. Um, and in general, uh, this tells us by optimality that any modifications that one may make to the linear sieve uh, will result in a, a bound uh, with a main term that is of equal or worse strength. Um, and I emphasize that this uh, is for a given level D. So any modification for a given level D will never get you a better uh, main term. Uh, however, uh, if the level itself D changes, then the, the bound might be a little bit better. And this, this is a, a point we will really develop uh, later on. So, uh, as a second pass, trying to describe a little bit more uh, in detail, uh, we, we first note that uh, combinatorial sieves in general of level D are defined uh, by a sequence of weights, uh, lambda of D, which take values either minus one, zero, 
or one uh, supported on uh, integers up to capital D. And these weights may be thought of as encoding a form of the inclusion exclusion principle. And uh, by the previous slide, we've seen that the linear sieve uh, does so in an optimal fashion. So we are denoting uh, the weights of the linear sieve by lambda plus in blue. And this is optimal, uh, at least in certain contexts. So the linear sieve tells us more, uh, more specifically that if uh, we have uh, the following error term in star be small, uh, then we recover the linear sieve bound that we've seen, uh, namely that s of a comma z is bounded by asymptotically the size of a times our familiar pro uh, product over primes up to z times this extra factor f of s, where s again is uh, log d divided by log z. So there are a few points worth emphasizing about this uh, error term star. So first of all, uh, our density function g is approximately uh, approximating the density of our set of multiples a, a sub d. So this difference uh, really should be uh, thought of as being small. And moreover, uh, we're taking a sum over all d's up to the level capital D uh, for which all the primes uh, in D are smaller than Z. And further, we're weighting this average essentially by the linear sieve weights lambda plus. And so this is uh, the structure of the, the error term that comes from the linear sieve. Uh, in particular, uh, now if we come to our uh, favorite example of the set of uh, numbers of the form p plus two, where p is a prime up to x, this error term in star now simplifies um, because the, the set of multiples a sub d will now just be counting the primes up to x, which are congruent to minus two mod d. Um, and this difference will now be uh, the error term in the prime number theorem for the arithmetic regression mod d uh, in the residue class minus two. And we are weighting again by the linear sieve uh, weights lambda plus. And suppose uh, now that star is small uh, up to level D, which we'll write as X to the theta for some number, real number theta. And we therefore write uh, Z to be just D to the one over S, uh, which is uh, X to the theta over S. Um, so under these conditions, uh, the linear sieve bound will tell us that the count S of A comma Z is bounded by uh, the size of A times our prime product uh, times F of S. And in particular, we recall that the density function G is one over phi, the Euler phi function, uh, which is just P minus one on primes. Um, but also, we've also seen that uh, the, the, we have a upper bound of S by the prime counting function prime counting function pi two. Uh, so the linear sieve bound will already give us a direct bound on the count of twin primes. Uh, and so by the prime number theorem, we can estimate the size of A, uh, this product over primes, uh, for which we recover um, uh, S2, uh, the, our, our twin prime constant. And also if we're making uh, the assumption that S is less than three, uh, we know exactly what uh, this factor capital F looks like, namely two times e to the gamma over s. And so uh, after the, all, all the dust settles, uh, we can combine, cancel out the e to the gammas, for example, and write z is equal to uh, x to the theta over s. Uh, we reduce to get a bound uh, of the form two times uh, uh, pi over theta. And here uh, we recall that pi is this Hardy-Littlewood asymptotic. And so uh, we've already, just by uh, applying a simple inequality of pi two uh, by s, and then applying the linear sieve bound, uh, we can recover uh, already uh, the expected order of magnitude within uh, a factor of two over theta. So as we recall, theta is this level. And so we, we can see that as theta increases, our upper bound gets better. And so we're, we're hoping to be able to raise the uh, this parameter theta uh, as large as possible. Um, but we'll see that this is not always, always uh, in the cards. Uh, 
for us. So this simple inequality bounding pi two by S, uh, we've seen that this already leads to a powerful bound of the right order of magnitude. Um, however, uh, this is somewhat inefficient uh, as we're uh, making some uh, losses in this inequality. Uh, and these losses can be recouped uh, sometimes uh, using more sophisticated techniques that relate the, prime uh, the twin prime counting function uh, to sieve methods. Uh, and this includes uh, the book stab iterations and the switching principle. Um, we won't describe in this talk uh, too much about uh, these methods, uh, which are by now uh, uh, well established, uh, but it's a it's an interesting historical point to note that this latter uh, method uh, called the switching principle was introduced uh, in the 1960s by Chen uh, in order to produce uh, his famous theorem. Namely, uh, there are infinitely many primes p such that p plus two has at most two prime factors. And uh, this is an important uh, partial progress uh, to the, the, the uh, twin prime conjecture, because if you could narrow uh, two prime factors down to one prime factor, you would recover the full conjecture. So we've seen that this linear sieve, uh, at least uh, from a, a bird's eye view, without getting too close uh, to the details so far, We've seen that could, we, we've tried to motivate how it can be a powerful tool uh, when combined with equidistribution estimates uh, to handle this error term star. Uh, in particular, uh, the bombieri vinogrado theorem shows that for any epsilon in A, uh, capital A, uh, if we let uh, our level theta uh, be any number uh, arbitrarily close to one half um, from below, then uh, the uh, difference in the prime number theorem for arithmetic progressions, uh, A mod Q, where uh, we take an absolute value of this difference and then take a supremum over all co-prime residues, A to Q, uh, and then take a, a sum uh, of, these, uh, uh, of these errors uh, over the worst residue uh, for module IQ, up to level theta, x, uh, for q up to uh, x to the theta, then this uh, bound saves us a, an arbitrary power of log, uh, a, a factors of log. And in many situations in number theory, uh, this may be viewed uh, as an assertion of the generalized Riemann hypothesis on average over moduli up to level a little less than one half. And in many situations, this is already uh, good enough as assuming the, re uh, the, the generalized Riemann hypothesis for applications. Uh, and it's important to note uh, before moving on that it is a, an open problem uh, to extend the range of validity of this uh, bound uh, for theta beyond one half, say to one half plus delta for some fixed delta. Um, and moreover, Elliott and Halberstam conjectured that the answer the, uh, for the truth of, of how large we can extend uh, should be all the way up to uh, one, minus, one minus epsilon for any epsilon uh, greater than zero. So this is a setup, just to recall, that we have a supremum and an absolute values in the bombieri vinogrado theorem. However, in some contexts, uh, one can uh, try to raise the level of distribution theta beyond one half uh, if we're allowing ourselves to restrict to certain uh, arithmetic progressions, A mod Q, that come in a special form. So in 1986, uh, Bombieri, Friedlander, and Ivanitz uh, raised this level of distribution up to theta equals four sevenths. And this was in the special case of a fixed residue class A. So we fix an integer a for all time uh, instead of taking a supremum. And moreover, instead of taking absolute values, we replace them by well-factorable weights, lambda, taking uh, values in minus one, zero, or one. And so for this restricted uh, distribution uh, question, uh, they raise the level up to four sevenths. 
Um, and just as a note, uh, uh, the notion of well factorability will be important to us, um, but it is a little uh, technical to describe. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to minimize uh, uh, this technicality as long as possible, um, as well as some further alternatives uh, of factorization properties. Um, but for, for, the, for the moment, we'll just uh, think of lambda, the, these weights, as just uh, a way of restricting to moduli Q uh, that have uh, nice factorizations. Uh, in particular, they'll have divisors uh, in convenient ranges. So uh, for the linear sieve, the weights, uh, which we've denoted by lambda plus, uh, are not themselves well factorable, unfortunately. However, Ivanitz uh, was able to make a modification to these weights, uh, which will denote by lambda plus tilde. Uh, and he did so in the course of uh, trying to, pro uh, to prove the following theorem in 1977, uh, that there are infinitely many numbers n such that n plus one has at most two prime factors. And uh, this is a important progress towards uh, a famous problem of Landau uh, on uh, primes uh, represented by n squared plus one. And so uh, the well factorable modifications already, uh, well, well factorability weight, well factorable weights already have uh, important ramifications uh, when, when they were first introduced. Uh, and uh, note um, uh, the level of distribution, four sevenths for these, these weights. Um, and uh, moreover, in this construction, uh, the, mod uh, the, the weights lambda plus tilde are only slightly altered from the original weights. Uh, and in particular, do not alter the form of the bound in the, in the linear sieve. So we get the uh, essentially for free, uh, the same uh, form of uh, the main term, and we are just replacing the original weights uh, in our bound uh, by our modified weights, lambda plus tilde. And doing so allows us to raise the distribution uh, up to uh, four sevenths. Uh, in general, for any arbitrary well factorable weights, uh, the best um, uh, four sevenths is the best level of distribution. Uh, we know, uh, and, and this uh, is still true today, um, but specifically for our purposes, uh, these linear sieve weights, at least their well factorable modification, uh, lambda plus tilde, um, this uh, situation has been improved uh, because Maynard quite recently extended uh, th this level further to 7 twelfths. And moreover, uh, this level 7 twelfths forms a natural barrier for these weights, uh, lambda plus tilde, uh, given uh, our current understanding of S equidistribution estimates for prime numbers. And in the main result of this talk, uh, we will uh, further modify the linear sieve weights to circumvent this level barrier of 7 twelfths. So to state the main theorem, we'll let theta be a number that's slightly less than 10 seventeenths as the level. And the statement is that there exists a sequence of weights, which we'll denote by lambda star tilde, which takes values in minus, zero, minus 1, 0, and 1, which satisfy two properties. The first, equidistribution of primes, namely that if we raise up to level, if we look up to level 10 seventeenths and take this uh, weighted average by this, these new weights, lambda star tilde, the difference in the prime number theorem for arithmetic regressions in D mod A for a fixed residue class A uh, is small. Uh, namely, we can save arbitrarily many uh, log factors. And the second property uh, is a new sieve upper bound namely for level uh, d to be x to the theta uh, and our familiar parameters s and z, we have uh, an upper bound for uh, the counting, uh, the count s of a comma z uh, by uh, a, the size of a times the product over primes up to z involving the density g 
and a, fact, a new factor, f star of s. And in the error term, we have our familiar sum where we now uh, weight uh, the sum up to d up to the level uh, by our new weights lambda star tilde. And in particular, so this new factor in the main term, f star, uh, is slightly larger, is only slightly larger than our original linear sieve function f. So this is the main result. And there are the, the key feature uh, of this modified sieve uh, is that we can uh, obtain equidistribution for prime numbers in arithmetic regressions up to level 10 17 at least in the regime of a fixed residue class and weighted by these uh, new sieve weights. And this comes at the cost of an only tiny loss in the main term. So as we recall, just in the, the general sieve framework, we know that for a given level, uh, the linear sieve gives an optimal uh, main term. Uh, and so we could never hope to do better than the main term for a given level. Uh, but we have a trade-off now that we're able uh, to raise the level uh, now at the cost of uh, deteriorating the main term a little bit, which turns out to be a, a, a useful trade-off. And uh, we expect this modified sieve should lead to several improvements for problems relating with the primes. And uh, as proof of concept in this direction, we obtain a new upper bound for twin primes uh, that we've seen uh, that pi two, the counting function, is asymptotically less than uh, 3.3, essentially, times uh, the Hardy-Littlewood asymptotic capital pi. And this is proven by combining this new sieve, uh, this modified sieve uh, weights with uh, established techniques such as bookstab iterations and the switching principle. Is everyone happy with uh, the statement? Are there any, any questions? OK. So this upper bound of pi 2 uh, being less than 3.3 .3 times capital pi uh, refines the previous bound of Wu by about 3%. And it gives the largest percent improvement for the problem since the bound of bombieri friedlener in Ivanitz. Specifically, we had uh, in this table below uh, the chronology of the bounds on the problem by Wu, by Kai and Lu in 2003, by Wu in 1990, uh, 1986, uh, with Fouvry and Grupp, and then Bombieri, Friedlander, and Ivanitz. Uh, 1984 with Fouvry, 1983 with Fouvry and Ivanitz, uh, in 1978 with Chen, uh, and then uh, more his, uh, a little bit further back uh, in the, the history with Bombieri, Davenport, and Han, and Selberg. So in the uh, remaining time I have, uh, I'd like to describe a little bit what uh, goes into the, the proof of this modified sieve. And to do so, I need to really describe how these uh, sieves are defined under the hood, or as they say, under the bonnet. So the upper bound weights lambda plus for the linear sieve are defined uh, as the restriction of the Mobius function to uh, a set d plus. And so specifically, if I'm uh, inputting an integer, a square free integer d uh, of the form p1 up to pr, it'll be minus 1 to the r uh, if uh, this lies in the uh, support set d plus and 0 otherwise. And this uh, support set d plus will implicitly be dependent on the level uh, x to the theta. And it's given uh, by the set of these integers, these square free integers, such that the largest prime factor is less than x to the theta over 3. And moreover, for every odd index s up to r, we have that uh, theta x to the theta is larger than the product of p1 up to p sub s minus 1 times p to the s, uh, p sub s to the, the third. And this exponent 3. Uh, might seem a bit uh, arbitrary, and the, the restriction to odd indices might appear uh, somewhat bizarre uh, on, on the first time seeing this uh, definition. Um, but uh, one may think of uh, this as 
uh, a very strategic way uh, of encoding uh, uh, the ex inclusion exclusion principle. And this turns out to be very uh, uh, efficient for, for doing so. So if we recall this definition of D plus to be square free integers, uh, which satisfy uh, X to the theta being greater than P1 up to P sub S to the third for all odd indices S. Uh, just to get a feeling for this, this set, we, we have an easy lemma to describe uh, what, uh, some factorization properties of the integers uh, in this support set. Namely, if uh, we are given any real non-negative reals U and V and any element of the set D plus of level uh, X to the U plus V, there will exist a factorization of D uh, into integers A and B uh, that respect uh, the level in the sense that the size of A is less at most X to the U and the size of B is at most X to the V. So for any ways of splitting our level theta essentially into U and a V, uh, there will exist a corresponding factorization D of D that respects this uh, splitting of, of the level. And so how does this go? This is quite um, a nice proof, only a few lines. So by definition, uh, we have our inequality uh, for all, uh, odd indices S up to R that the level uh, X to the U plus V is at most P1 times uh, up to PS cubed. And then just using the simple bound uh, that PS cubed is at most uh, PS times uh, P sub S plus one squared, just simply uh, using uh, the order of the primes. Uh, this will imp imply that for even indices, we get an analogous uh, inequality uh, where we uh, relax the exponent three down to two. And uh, in particular, this inequality will hold for all indices S regardless of parity. And then uh, once we have this uh, by an easy induction uh, on S, uh, we will be able to uh, inductively factorize the partial product P1 up to PS uh, into A and B, uh, where A is less than X to the U and B is less than X to the V. So this, this lemma for the set D plus really motivates the following definition. Uh, so if we fix a level theta, we call an integer D to be well factorable if for any partition of the level theta into U and V, there will exist a corresponding factorization of D into A and B that respects it. Namely, that the size of A is at most X to the U and the size of B is most X to the V. And for the purposes of this talk, we'll say that the weights lambda are well factorable if and only if lambda is supported on well factorable integers. And this is a definition that's useful to keep in mind. But uh, if you try to look at uh, look at literature on the subject, it's not uh, quite correct. Uh, there's a more technical definition involving uh, convolutions of uh, one bounded functions. Um, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, uh, this is uh, a good uh, idea to keep in mind. And by Ivanitz, uh, we don't really lose uh, much by adopting this uh, fiction. And so by the previous slide, uh, every integer D in our linear sieve support D plus is well factorable. And indeed, for this is so for any level theta. And uh, so too, uh, uh, we'll say that the, uh, the linear sieve weights will be well factorable. So we recall that Bombieri, Friedlander, and Ivanitz proved equidistribution of primes in arithmetic regression weighted by uh, well-factorable uh, weights, lambda, up to level uh, four sevenths. So the following uh, is a natural generalization. Uh, given the definition of well-factorability, it is natural to consider the, the following generalization. So we say that an integer is triply well factorable if for any partition of the level theta into three parts, u, v, and w, non-negative reals, there will exist a corresponding integer factorization of d into a, b, and c that respect the partition. Namely, that a is at most x to the u, b is at most x to the v, and c is at most x to the w. Importantly, uh, Maynard, proved equidistribution for primes uh, using triply factorable uh, weights uh, up to level three fifths. 
But unfortunately, uh, in the case of the linear sieve, uh, the weights lambda plus are not triply well factorable, uh, even at level one half. Uh, and this is because there are easy canner examples uh, of integers d uh, lying in the support set up to level x to the one half, which do not admit such a factorization. And because of this, uh, if we're interested in studying the linear sieve and getting bounds for larger levels, uh, this definition will be too restrictive for our purposes. So now we come to uh, a more technical, uh, but uh, uh, more, uh, but uh, 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 a, a definition that is implied by triple uh, factorability, triply well factorability. So we say that uh, an integer d up to level x of the theta is programmably factorable if for any real number uh, u between zero and a third, there exists a partition using a partition of the level theta using this given uh, real number u into three parts for some other v and w non-negative. And there is a factorization of d uh, into integers a, b, and c such that uh, that respect this partition, namely that a is most x to the u, b is at most x to the v, and c is at most x to the w. And moreover, uh, this partition u, v, and w uh, these parts, U, V, and W, satisfy this system uh, of linear programming type uh, inequalities in, in this display. Uh, it turns out that uh, theta being equal to three fifths is the maximum level uh, for which uh, the above this linear uh, programming type system of inequalities will admit a solution, uh, U, V, and W. And for this max level three fifths, uh, Maynard actually uh, proved equidistribution of primes uh, for programmably factorable weights. So if you're given any programmably factorable weights, you can get equidistribution of primes and arithmetic progressions on average up to level three fifths. However, in the case of the linear sieve weights, uh, uh, lambda plus is uh, only programmably factorable up to level seven twelfths. Not, not the full three-fifths. And so this uh, suggests uh, that in order to raise the level, uh, we should try to, uh, uh, to make some modifications to the linear sieve. And in this vein, uh, the key observation here is that uh, there are only a few exceptional integers in the support set D plus that, sat that fail to satisfy these programmably factorable conditions. Uh, and so for level a level uh, near uh, 7 twelfths, um, uh, to give a flavor of what uh, the picture looks like at around this uh, barrier 7 twelfths, uh, the exceptional d, so, so for theta slightly larger than uh, 7 twelfths, uh, there will be some integers in the support set that are not programmably factorable, uh, roughly of size x to the theta. Um, and they come in roughly two flavors. They are either uh, have two large prime factors, p1 and p2, that are roughly of the size x to the 2 theta over 7. And they have two medium-sized prime factors, uh, p3 and p4, uh, that are of the size x to the theta over 7. So that's one kind uh, of exception. Or there's a second kind uh, where you have seven, uh, where you have, sorry, you have six prime factors that are of uh, roughly the size uh, x uh, to the theta over seven. And so uh, in both of these cases, uh, they contribute uh, x, to the six, x to the six theta over seven, and then the remaining primes will all be very small uh, and contribute the, re the remaining uh, x to the seventh to, to make uh, d the full size x to the theta. So this gives a rough, si uh, a rough picture of what these exceptions look like. And, uh, more precisely, uh, if we describe, if we let uh, eta be a small parameter uh, and let the level be written as 7 twelfths plus eta, as eta ranges uh, up to 1 over 204, uh, the, the level theta will range up to uh, 10 17ths. And in, in this regime of, of, of suitably small eta, the anatomy of these exceptional 
integers in the support set D plus at, at this level x to the theta may be precisely characterized. Um, and they're given by uh, they th these exceptional integers form explicit polytopes uh, described in terms of eta of dimensions four and six. And these dimensions uh, four and six uh, are really coming from these two uh, families uh, uh, in, uh, as above. And moreover, uh, as eta grows, uh, the contribution of these exceptional D uh, give uh, roughly order of magnitude a to the fifth uh, deterioration to this uh, linear sieve bound. Um, the, the linear sieve main term in, in, the, in the bound. Um, and so uh, we we're presented essentially with a trade-off in which we are raising the level by eta to the one and then deteriorating the main term in, in the linear sieve by uh, eta to the fifth. And, and this characteristic note, uh, if eta is too large, uh, in this case, uh, one over 204, uh, this neat characterization uh, breaks down and the contributions uh, to the sieve bound becomes much larger and more complicated. And so uh, this characterization, at least for eta small enough, gives us a recipe of how to modify the linear sieve weights uh, up to the level of characterization 10 17. And this is also in combination with Ivanitz's modifications. So now to summarize uh, our discussion uh, in this talk, we have uh, seen that Maynard's new results give equidistribution of the primes in arithmetic progressions to large moduli using sieve weights uh, that take values in minus one, zero, or one, provided D is restricted to integers that have suitably nice factorizations. Uh, unfortunately, the classical linear sieve weights only partially satisfy these uh, nice factorization conditions. And so in particular, it turns out that level 7 twelfths is a natural barrier for the linear sieve weights, given our current equidistribution knowledge. Uh, and this is because uh, if you take the level beyond 7 twelfths, there will be uh, examples of integers D in the support set D plus that have bad factorizations. Uh, and as such, this, uh, these uh, family of exceptions uh, suggest to us that we should revise uh, the construction of the linear sieve uh, at certain points, uh, altering a few particular inclusion exclusion. Uh, essentially, uh, this amounts to altering a few steps in the inclusion exclusion argument in order to avoid these exceptional integers with bad factorizations. And once these terms no longer contribute to the sieve, this will produce a worse and more complicated uh, main term uh, because in general for a fixed level, uh, the linear sieve gives uh, the optimal main term. Uh, however, uh, there are only a very few number of uh, such exceptional terms and therefore the, uh, the resulting loss in the main term will be small. Uh, and finally, uh, once we've made this modification, these weights will have nicer factorization properties in their support and therefore can leverage strong equidistribution results. And uh, we've seen already that this modified linear sieve uh, leads to improved bounds for twin primes. And it's likely that uh, there'll be applications to other problems in number theory. And with that, I thank you. All right, let's all uh, unmute and clap and thank Jared for a great talk. All right, questions? Maybe I'll start us off. So where like, does the system in the definition of programmably factorable come from? Um, so this is really in the, the in the heart, like the nitty gritty details of uh, Maynard's uh, work on equidistribution of primes and arithmetic regressions to large moduli. Um, and in, indeed, this uh, type of uh, linear programming style uh, system 
uh, was already kind of implicit in the work of Bombieri, Friedlander, and Ivanitz. Uh, instead of three variables, they had a two variable system. Um, and it turned out that that system was essentially uh, equivalent or essentially giving no loss by um, working with well factorable weights. And so well factorable uh, arose kind of as a, a, a convenient definition that really captured all that was going on. Uh, on, when under the hood that there was this uh, kind of system of uh, inequalities. Um, however, uh, kind of one of the key insights of Maynard's results was that uh, if you added a third uh, variable, um, you could try to gain some uh, hidden uh, equidistribution in the primes and raise the level. Uh, however, and, and so this kind of leads naturally to a definition of triply well factorable. However, the kind of underlying mechanism uh, that enables equidistribution um, that we can leverage for the, the linear sieve turn out to not be captured by this kind of uh, nice, nice sounding definition of triply well factorable, mm -hmm. that you really have to work with the under the, under the hood uh, uh, mechanism. Thanks. Any other questions? Hi, Jared. Is it possible to um, uh, outline some of the other possible applications you envisage? Um, sure. So, I mean, already uh, there are, well, of, the, of a similar uh, flavor. So if we go back to uh, Chen's result, um, there are kind of existing uh, works in the literature. Uh, for example, the most recent due to Wu, making a quantitative version of Chen's theorem uh, to give a lower bound uh, for the number of kind of Chen primes up to X. Um, and so, so this is in a, in a similar spirit to how one would obtain uh, using kind of the established techniques uh, for Pi 2. Um, it, it's a little, I mean, the, the details are a little bit more involved, but uh, the morally speaking, the, the, ingredients, the ingredients are there. Um, and there, 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 are, there are similar uh, problems involving prime numbers. Um, but yeah, so 